Revelation chapter 13, and we're reading beginning with verse 1. I notice that there are a number in the audience almost every Sunday who come for the first time. Now this puts a strain upon the one who is expounding the book of Revelation because immediately I have an inferiority complex. I have the complex that perhaps some of you are not quite as familiar with the particular portion that we are dealing with as you might be of some other sections of the Word of God. And so because of my complex and because I think that it might be true in a few cases at least, I would like to at least read the 13th chapter. Uh, we are speaking this morning on the latter part of it and particularly the mark of the beast. But we ought to know about the beasts before we know about the mark of the beast. And so we are reading the entire chapter, chapter 13. Now remember, these events are set in a time period in the future, after the true church of Jesus Christ has left this earthly scene. During the period of the Great Tribulation, which is a time of judgment upon both Gentile and Jew preparatory to the second advent of our Lord Jesus who shall establish his kingdom upon the earth. Now the dragon or Satan is standing on the seashore and plotting his future and final activities. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Uh, you will notice that as we are reading through this section, the characteristic word is the word given. Because this first beast, or the Antichrist, is one who is given his authority by the dragon, or Satan, who stands behind him as his power and influence. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. You will notice the words, what the Spirit saith to the churches, are not found here because the church is not upon the earth at this time. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. Now the characteristic word in this section is the word causeth, because you see this second beast is one who exercises authority of another, and so, and also desires to glorify that other. And so we read in verse 12, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, 
that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Now, we saw last week that this was not life but breath. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark. Now the little word or is not found in the most ancient Greek manuscripts of the book of Revelation. In my Bible, I have put brackets around it, and I think it's important for it tells us that the mark is the name of the beast. For the next expression is, if you remember your English grammar, in apposition with it. And that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, or it is man's number. And his number is six hundred three score and six. Is the mark of the beast, the expression that is found in the latter part of the thirteenth chapter of the book of Revelation. Do you remember that last Sunday morning when I introduced the message on the beast out of the land, I mentioned the fact that the program of God succeeds because of an unseen father, because of an incarnate son, and because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And then I mentioned that the program of Satan is designed to counterfeit the program of God. And it succeeds so far as it succeeds because of an unseen dragon who is the anti-God, because of a restored beast, the anti-Christ, and because of the power of the false spirit, the unholy spirit, the false prophet. And so just as there is a triunity in the Trinity, so there is a counterfeit of the Trinity, yet not a genuine one, in the organization of the satanic world. The origin of all of this, of course, takes us back to the 14th chapter of the prophecy of Isaiah, in which we have the five great I wills of Lucifer, who is here pictured as the representative of Satan. You'll remember that Lucifer in the ages past when he sinned said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And it has been the determined purpose and plan of Satan ever since to be like God. In fact, he would like to be the God. And his activities remarkably counterfeit the work of God. So we have then an eternal trinity, and if I may be permitted to play on words, also an infernal one. Many years ago, G. Campbell Morgan used to go up and down the Western world preaching the word. He was one of the outstanding Bible expositors of his day. Near the end of his life, he made this remarkable statement, and I think it is very true. Being, I suppose, near the end of my life, because I've long since passed middle age, I can understand what he's driving at when he said, the older I get and the more I study the Bible, the more I find that when I take a text, it takes the whole Bible to explain that text. Now, if that is true of the ordinary text in Scripture, it is surely true of the texts of the book of Revelation, for this is the capstone of Holy Scripture, 
It is the Union Depot of prophecy, as Dr. Chafer used to say. It is the place in which all of the strands of divine revelation reach their climax. And so I find that when I come to Revelation 13 and I look out into an audience like this, and some of you have not been here, it's just possible that you have not understood or do not understand all of the background of this passage that we're looking at this morning. But let me just briefly describe what we have studied in Revelation chapter 13. We have seen in the opening 10 verses that John saw a vision in which a wild beast is pictured as like the Lord Jesus Christ. He is, we believe, the Antichrist. He is represented, that is, he is a man who is represented as a wild beast because of the type of person he is and because of the ministry that he shall exercise in the last days. We were, I'm sure, if we studied these verses very closely, a little surprised to discover that the Antichrist apparently is such an attractive, cunning kind of world emperor. We would not have expected him to be this kind of person. We would have expected him to be the kind of person who could easily be singled out as evil and wicked. And we would never have expected him to be presented in the way in which he is presented here. For he apparently is a very attractive person, for he commands the worship of the world. He apparently is a very cunning person who is able to arrange such a situation as this. He is a world emperor because all the world worships him. And furthermore, he has had a supernatural experience. His deadly wound was healed, and the whole world wondered after the beast because of this supernatural experience that he had. Now, I am not here to suggest who is the Antichrist. I do not know any more than you. I do know this, though, that I do not think that this man is a Stalin kind of man. He is not a Hitler kind of man. He is not a Mussolini kind of man. He is not a Brezhnev kind of man. But if I may say this without any implications other than this statement, he is a Jack Kennedy kind of man. In other words, he is a kind of man who would command the respect and the admir admiration of the good people throughout the world. In fact, I thought when all of that extravagant play was given in the newspapers to the funeral of Jack Kennedy, that if that coffin had opened and he had stepped out, then I would not have been surprised, except that I was here. I would not have been surprised. <laughs> For it seemed to me that it is just this kind of man in other words, a man who is attractive, who commands wide influence, who is very intelligent, the kind of man whom people would like to worship, perhaps. And I'm not suggesting in any way, and I want to make this very plain, that Jack Kennedy was or was not a Christian. I do not know. I just know that the Antichrist is that kind of a man. Intelligent, attractive, respected, the kind of man that good people would like to worship. This is the kind of man that we have. And furthermore, he has had this supernatural experience. He is the kind of man to whom the dragon will come and will say, as he said to the Lord Jesus, if you will bow down before me and worship me, all of the kingdoms of this earth shall be thine. And he is a man who swallows the bait of the dragon to his own ruin. Then in the latter part of this chapter, we were introduced to a second beast. This beast was somewhat different from the first. He is a beast who comes up out of the earth. Now, if the first beast comes out of the sea, representative of the nations, the second beast comes out of the earth or perhaps out of the land. If we are to understand this expression as out of the land, and the Greek 
fully supports it, then we might suggest, or we might have a suggestion here, that this man could be a Jewish man, the false prophet. We cannot be sure of this. There are several other indications that this might be true. For it is true that this first great ruler makes a covenant with Israel back in the land and allows them to set up again their ancient worship. And if the false prophet is a Jew, the one who glorifies the Antichrist, then one can see how Israel might be more inclined to follow the leadership of the Antichrist if he were a Jew. I say we cannot prove that from the text. This is pure supposition, except to say that the text supports it. For the word gase, which is used here, is a word that does mean land. So this beast comes up out of the land. He has two horns like a lamb. He has two horns because, of course, he is to testify to the anti-lamb, the anti-God, the anti-Christ. And so the two which mark, which is the mark of testimony, is suitable to him. He is like the lamb. He looks very gentle. He looks very sweet. He almost looks lost. The kind of person you know that women like to mother, a little lamb, and he is one who speaks, though the text says, like a dragon. In other words, we're going to see the final great counterfeit of Satan. We're going to see the greatest of the seductions of the age, because this man is going to seduce the whole world as Satan seduced Eve in the Garden of Eden and caused the whole world to worship the Antichrist or the first beast. And furthermore, just as our Lord Jesus supported his claims by miraculous powers, so the false prophet will support his claims concerning the Antichrist by great supernatural powers too. He will do great wonders. They are lying wonders, Paul tells us, but nevertheless they are wonders, and the whole world will be amazed, startled, and they will be won over to the ministry of the false prophet. One of his greatest wonders is described in the 13th verse. He causes fire to come down from heaven to the earth in the sight of men. This in the Old Testament, remember, was the sign through Elijah that Elijah's God was the true God. And so in the last days, this false prophet, perhaps he is the minister of religion in the cabinet of the Antichrist, he causes fire to come down from heaven before men, and then I'm sure makes the connection with 1 Kings chapter 18 to demonstrate to men that he is the one who is leading the true worship of the everlasting God. The miracles that he performs prove that what he says is, prove that what he says is really the truth of God. So then the worship of the beast becomes international religion. We have a great final ecumenical movement that really does cover the whole of the world. I said last time that I did not have too much confidence in the ecumenical movement of today. I have discovered from the reading of the Word of God that you may bring all of unbelievers together, as many as possible, but you do not increase spiritual power by numbers. I quoted Lord, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones' statement that you may take all of the ecclesiastical corpses of our present day, bring them into the same graveyard, but you will not create a resurrection. And that, I feel, is absolutely true today. We do not have any hopes whatsoever from the worldwide ecumenical movement. If there is no spiritual power in a movement, you can add all all of the people to it that you wish and you do not have any more spiritual power. 
Spiritual power may exist in one person who is yielded to God and in allegiance to the Word of God. And more spiritual power exists when two or three gather together in the name of the Lord Jesus and honor the Holy Scriptures and the Christ of them than thousands who gather together but who do not honor the Lord Jesus Christ and do not enthrone the Scriptures as the standard for faith and practice. I fully believe this with all my heart, and that is why I would enjoy preaching to a congregation as small as this, though we're getting near the end of our capacity here, it looks like, as small as this rather than great masses of people who have only a form of the truth, but who do not have the reality thereof and do not desire to have that reality. So here is then worldwide religion. It is led by the false prophet. He, as the Holy Spirit glorifies Christ, he glorifies the Antichrist, the false prophet. That is his duty, and that he does, and he does well. Now in the midst of this period of time, which is a period of time of at least seven years, Daniel the prophet tells us that the covenant that is made between the Antichrist and Israel, allowing them to continue their worship, is broken. For after all, we want to have universal religion, and we don't want any Jews in the land who have their own religion. We are going to have, in that time, we are going going to have coercion in spiritual things. And so the covenant is to be broken by the Antichrist with Israel, and he ordains that an image of himself be set up in the temple in Jerusalem. And it is the duty of the false prophet to see that this takes place. The lieutenant or the minister of religion will attempt to carry it out. Carry it out. Now the Lord Jesus spoke of this time. He said, when you see the abomination of desolation, as Daniel the prophet prophesied, standing in the holy place, then beware. And those of you who are in the field, flee. Don't bother to come back and pack your trunk, but go as fast as you can. If you're on the, the flee to the mountains of Judea, flee where wherever you possibly can, because at that time there shall be a great tribulation such as the word world has not seen in past, nor in the present time, nor ever will see. In other words, there is to be a time of earthly judgment that is so great and so magnificent in its outreach that nothing shall ever be like it again. Now it is the duty then of the false prophet to see that this worship is carried out. And so we read here that he sets up an image of the beast. And furthermore, he has power to give breath to the image of the beast. Now I said last time that this word breath is really breath. It is not life. In other words, what we have here is a miraculous attempt to authenticate the worship of the Antichrist, or the first beast. Now, I think that I ought to stop here for just a moment and point out that this particular miracle is probably one of the climactic miracles. Did you read in the newspapers recently of some further attempts of scientists to discover the secret of life? I read a little article a few weeks ago. I wish I had cut it out. But in it, one scientist claimed to have discovered some secret of cellular life, and that this may be one further step on the way to the, to the discovery of the secret of life itself. Now, if anyone ever discovers the secret of life, I would be surprised. But I am not surprised as I read this passage here, because it seems to me that the one who will come closest to the discovery of the secret of life will be the Antichrist and his right-hand man, the false prophet. And whatever secret they discover apparently is enough to deceive the people of the earth in that time. For we read in the 15th verse that he had power to give breath unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak 
and caused that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. I'm not surprised that men wouldn't be gullible enough to believe almost anything. It may be that they will not, not be able to do anything more than people are able to do today. I sometimes wonder how it is that people can be deceived by the so-called miracles that take place today. A great religious organization tells us of great miracles that have taken place in the past on the banks of the Tiber and elsewhere throughout the world. But you know, if you study ancient history, you will discover that, uh, that smiling Madonnas and weeping Madonnas are nothing new. That if you go all the way back to the time of the ancients, you will discover that things that have taken place in the past on the banks of the Tiber and elsewhere throughout the world. But you know, if you study ancient history, you see it has been within the province of men all along to counterfeit the truth and to lead the unwary astray. It may be that that is what we have here. But I am inclined to think in the light of what Paul says and our Lord says that they shall do such great miracles that if it were possible they should deceive the very elect that if you were to look at the image of the beast, you would think that image was alive. And when that image spoke, you would perhaps say J Dr. Johnson apparently was not right at all because this obviously is of God. That is, if you have the misfortune not to believe in Jesus Christ and find yourself in the presence of the image at some day in the future. So I'm not sure about this, but it seems to me that the context indicates that this is a remarkable miracle and, and that even the most wise will be led astray by it. In the 15th verse we read, and caused that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Men are trying to get rid of capital punishment today, but capital punishment is going to continue with us. And here it is, right here. But we want to talk about the mark of the beast this morning for a while, and so let's go on to the 16th verse. Everyone wants to know what 666 means, don't they? When I was young, we used to grow, we used to travel the highways in the south, and we would see signs, 666. Now that was some kind of remedy for a headache or for a cold, I think, in those days. But it was, it derived its name from this. So we read now in verse 17, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, that is the name of the beast, or the number of his name. This is the ration card of the tribulation period. If you don't have the mark in your right hand or in your forehead, you're not going to be able to sell or you're not going to be able to buy. Now, Mr. Pryor was telling us in Sunday school this morning of all that computers can do and all that the government can do by means of its computers. Why, the government can probably, through their computers, find out just about shortly after you leave this auditorium that you have attended Believer's Chapel on 11 o'clock Sunday morning. Now, in those days, I'm sure that they will be able to just plot your life out just like a graph, you know? Every bit of income you have is now down in print. Every kind of thing that you do that involves that is all now programmed so they can discover it. In this day, apparently we're going to have something that is even worse than all of this, if you think that's bad. Here we have that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark. And I suppose that every time you buy, every time you sell, you must make a little mark and that too must be sent to the computer so that they can discover exactly what you have purchased and exactly what you have sold. So you can see that this is a regulated economy. A really regulated economy. Now, the mark itself, what is that? Well, now John says, here is wisdom. Now, many interpreters have passed by this and tried to discover what 666 meant without noticing that statement, here is wisdom, because they have left wisdom in attempting to interpret 666. What does it mean? What is this 666? What is the mark of the beast? It is also his name, too. 
Now let me, just for your edification, try to summarize the approaches that have been taken to the interpretation of 666. Some have looked at this and have said, well, that obviously is a chronological number. 666, that's the duration of the life of the beast. He will endure for 666 days or years or period of time. Few in hold that interpretation any longer. Others look at this and say, since this states that it is the number of a man, then there must be some reference to a particular man. And since this book was written in the first century, is it not likely that the man referred to here would be a man of the first century? So they refer this mark of the beast or the number of his name to a distinct person who probably existed in the first century. Now they do this by means of the sounds of gematria, if we may call that a sound. Now let me explain to you what gematria is. It's not really very difficult at all if you just remember one or two little things. The children can easily understand this. In the days in which the Bible was written, they did not have Arabic numbers such as we have. One, two, three, four, five, six, and I should have added figures for them. They had the numbers, one, two, three, and so on. They could count. But they did not use separate figures for their numbers. They used the letters of the alphabet. So you see, for the number one in Greek, you would write alpha. So that would be one. Beta would be two. Gamma would be three. If you wanted to say learn one, two, three, you would say learn A, B, C, or alpha, beta, gamma. In other words, they used their letters to count so that it was possible, you see, to have a number which meant a number, but which also might, by this science, refer to a name. Now, we have discovered some interesting little inscriptions in ancient times. For example, girls and boys, there has been discovered an inscription which reads like this. I love her whose number is 540. Now, that isn't the exact number of the inscription. I've forgotten the exact number, but it's something like that. I love her whose number is 540. Now, of course, that was a way to tell the one whom you loved that you loved her, and yet at the same time conceal it from anyone else, because, of course, there would be other names that would add up to 542. You know how we used to do in the earliest, in the, in the earlier days, men? Do you remember that when you used to take your pocket knife out and you'd get on the other side of the tree and you'd cut a heart in that tree and you would say, uh, S-L-J loves M-M, or something like that, you know. Now, of course, if M-M came by, M-M could tell who S-L-J was, but others might be a little puzzled, you see. So in those days, they would say, I love her whose number is. By the way, if any of you have any ideas, my number is 500 and 645. I figured it out last night just to clue you in. So if you want to go around and check on any trees, I love 645. I'll understand that you're talking about me. Now, you see, if this is a number to be interpreted this way, then 666 is the total of the letters of a man's name. So, all we have to do, you see, is to just take all of the names of antiquity and figure out their numbers. Well, it is very interesting that the name of an outstanding king in the first century, emperor, Nero Caesar comes to 666. Now it comes to 666, not in Greek, but in Hebrew. So if you spell it in Hebrew, it comes to 666. But it doesn't quite come to 666 
unless you drop out a little leather, which usually was used. Sometimes it was not. So most interpreters have said, if this is the name of a man, it is probably the name of Nero Caesar, that vile, wicked emperor. I'm not prepared to say this is not Nero Caesar because, of course, we cannot be positive. It may be that this is a reference to Nero Caesar. But if it is a reference to Nero Caesar, Nero Caesar is only singled out here as an illustration of the Antichrist to come. And I think that perhaps, if that is a reference to him, that is the meaning. But personally, I don't think that is it. Do you know that you can also, by use of gematria, discover or make 666 be the name of the Pope? For the Latin expression, the Vicar of Christ, comes to 666. It can be made to mean the number of Napoleon. It can also be the name of Kaiser Wilhelm, whom we think had a large part in World War I. Men discovered that in the World War, you know, that the Kaiser's number was 666. But it also can be shown to be the number of Martin Luther, much to Catholics' delight, and also the number of John Knox, the great Pres Scottish Presbyterian. So you see, by using this kind of methodology, we cannot really be sure at all of what this number is. I therefore myself take an entirely different kind of interpretation. I think if you examine this text carefully in the Greek, you will discover that he is not saying that this is the number of a man at all. Let me translate it as I think it should be translated. Now in the first place, if he had meant this for the name of a man, when he wrote here, for it is the number of a man, he would not have used the Greek word anthropos, which is man generically, but he would have used the Greek word air, which is a male man. In other words, if he had a definite human being, a masculine person in mind, he would have used a special type of Greek construction. It would have been the number of a male man, as over against uh, this generic term, which might even mean a woman. Furthermore, I think he would have said the name of a certain man, or the name of one man. As a matter of fact, it's very indefinite in the Greek. There is no definite article. It should be translated, for it is man's number. Man's number. The number of mankind, 666. Six, six. Well, now, when you study the Bible, you will discover this. Now, I know some of you are going to raise your eyebrows, but don't you raise your eyebrows until you've studied the Bible some. And when you've studied the Bible a little while, then you won't raise your eyebrow and you'll come to me and say, you were right, Dr. Johnson. Because you see, the number seven is the number of completeness. And it's not only the number of completeness in the Bible, it's the number of completeness in other ancient literature. The ancients knew that this figure seven was the figure of completeness or maturity. The very fact that we have seven days in the week was, intent, was uh, the background of this number seven. Six days God created man and this earth. He rested in the seventh day. That was the completion of the work of God. Seven through the Bible then is the number of completeness. It is amazing how often this number appears in this kind of context. Read the Bible and see for yourself. Now, if this be true, then six, of course, is the fitting day for man. For man was created on the sixth day. He was given six days in which he is to work. There are many things that are said about man in, with the use of the number six. When Nebuchadnezzar set his great image up in the plain of Dura, the, the image was 60 cubits high and six cubit wide. Even Goliath's statue and his, and his sword are described in terms like this. Six is the number of incompleteness. It is the number of man. I think that Harry Emerson Fosdick should have learned this. Once 
He was speaking about knowing God. And he said, if you have trouble in believing in God, let me suggest that you do this. Believe in man. And perhaps if you believe in man, then you will be able to rise to belief in God. Now, of course, he was a rank liberal in his theology. But he demonstrates the fact that man has a hard time comprehending the fact that he is incomplete, inadequate, and dependent. And it seems to me that the Holy Spirit is saying here, the number of the beast is 666. This is the climax of man's inadequacy. Here is the greatest man who has ever been brought forth from among mankind according to human standards, and his number is 666. In every digit he falls short of the perfect number. He is the incomplete man because he is the, la he is the man who is without God par excellence. Now it is not surprising that others should have dis tried to discover what is the number of the name of Jesus. And even outside of the inspired scriptures, in the Sibylline articles, for example, it is stated and stated correctly that the name of Jesus is not 777, as you might suspect, but rather 888. For 8, of course, is the number of the new beginning. Do you know anything about music? Do you know what the law of the octave is? Do you know that Bach's children had a very neat way of waking their father. Do you know what they did? They would go over to the piano and play a few bars, but omit the last bar. It would wake him up every time. He would get out of his bed and rush over and play that last chord. He had to. I had a friend who was a Bible teacher, and he read about that, and he determined to try it out. And so he tried it out on his children, and it worked. They couldn't stand it. They had to do something about it, you know. Dr. Lewis Perry Chafer, who was the president of the seminary, was an outstanding music man. And one day he told us in class that he had discovered this too. And his wife also was an outstanding musician. They played and composed music. And one day he thought he would play a trick on her. She was upstairs in the house. And so he got over at the piano and he played a few chords but omitted that last chord. And she couldn't stand it. She finally yelled down and said, Lewis, for goodness sake, play that last chord. Now you see, the Lord Jesus is the perfection of the octave. Eight, eight, eight. That is his number. The number of the new beginning. The number of the new life. The number that fits the man who has genuinely gone into death and who has come forth in resurrection, not as man's man, not as this great, cunning, attractive world leader who shall sway all of men to the worship of him, but as the God-man, the man who is the man supreme and the God supreme to the Savior of men through whom we may have genuine, everlasting life. Have you put your trust in him? Have you believed in him? If you have not believed in him, you may see the day in which the image of the beast is set up. But that day will be too late. For Paul tells us very plainly that if we have not believed in Jesus Christ in this age, having had the gospel preached plainly and clearly to us, we shall not believe then, for we shall believe that lie. And so today I want to say in all solemnity, Jesus Christ has died for you upon the cross at Calvary. There is no salvation except in God's man, the Lord Jesus, who shed his blood for your sins. And if you will come to him and say, thank you, Lord, for dying for me, you will have everlasting life. May God help you to put your faith and trust in him right now, whether you are young or whether you are old. May we rise for the benediction. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit, 
be in a bad with all who know him in sincerity. And, O oh, Father, for those who do not know him, we pray that the Holy Spirit may take the things of Christ and bring them home to their hearts so that they lean upon him whom to know his life eternal. May thy blessing go with us now, for we ask it in the name of the triune God, 